from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We're now going to begin the second of our sub-panels, and the topic is Seeing What's in Store, the Future in the Literary and Scientific Imagination. How do we think about the future? As I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, nobody's perfected the crystal ball, or maybe fortunately, um, but we do have various ways, various tools, um, including literature and the, the human imagination. And uh, we've assembled some panelists this morning who've thought about that in different ways. And let me introduce them now from um, my left to right, and then we'll, we'll uh, get the discussion started. So on um, what I guess is stage right, but my left, is that true? Is that stage right? Consider yes. <laughs> I always get confused when I'm on stage, but over there, <laughs> we have science fiction author, and uh, I would also consider him an environmental philosopher, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. And uh, Stan is the author of, oh, I don't know, must be about 20 books by now, and um, prolific and um, very creative, and one of the people who I think has really uh, thought and imagined deeply about possible human futures uh, plausible human futures as a result of the kind of scientific and, and technical uh, uh, forces that we're discussing today. He's uh, famously the author of the, uh, the, the, the Mars Trilogy, which many of you uh, know about, which imagines uh, future ecological evolution on Mars. And um, I could tell you more about his books and such, but I, I, I won't. Please read the printed material. But uh, we're uh, very, very pleased to have uh, Stan here to lend his thoughts. Sitting in the middle is um, Dr. Stephen Dick, who uh, is a historian, an astronomer. Um, and um, it, it may be strange to say it, but he's sort of the next me. In, <laughs> in, that, in that he's, the, he's the, uh, my successor here, as he's been selected as the 2014 chair of astrobiology here at the Kluge Center. And uh, I think he's, uh, it's an excellent choice. In fact, he's been a big um, influence and, and source for, for my work because he literally wrote the book on the history of astrobiology, um, the standard uh, book, and, and also is, uh, has done a lot of other work having to do with history and, uh, and astronomy and space science. Uh, he's a former, um, Chief Historian of NASA, and um, very pleased that he's here to lend his historical and astronomical perspective to the proceedings. And finally, sitting next to me here is um, Ursula Heise, and I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. And um, Ursula is uh, one of these people who uh, seems to reside on the, the boundary between literature and uh, technological studies. She's a professor of English, and um, she's on the faculty of the Institute of Environmentally, uh, Environmental and Sustainability, and she's done a lot of work about speculative literature and sort of literature, liter um, the, the uh, um, literature and technological imaginings of the human future, and uh, very pleased to have her with us. So uh, with that, brief set of intros. Um, we'll, uh, I'll let you guys have at it. Why don't you uh, start off, Stan? My pleasure, and thank you, David, for having me here. Um, I'm going to speak to you for the science fiction community um, that I'm a part of, which is really a, a kind of ongoing uh, conversation, very active, of the, the topic that we're discussing today in this conference, the long-range future of humanity. And since the previous panel brought up the, um, the concept of the commons, uh, the, the problem of the commons and of uh, enclosure, I will tell a story, which is that uh, science fiction began uh, um, when, we, um, when human beings uh, began to realize that history, especially human history, was not something that happened to them, but something that we do. And so this is the time of the great revolutions. 
And it was exactly when the commons, uh, the enclosure of the commons came to its end that the immiseration caused by that was severe enough that the great revolutions happened. The English Revolution, the French Revolution, the American Revolution. And the response to the successful enclosure of the commons was democratic government. And so you can think of democratic government as the virtual commons established to, in reaction to the enclosure of the physical commons. And so now when we have what we call privatization, it's still enclosure. There's still a commons, which is what we do in common together, the public sphere. There's still enclosure or attempted enclosure of the commons in the privatization movement. So I think especially at the Library of Congress, the, you know, the greatest library on earth and a public library, it's, a, it's important to point that out and that science fiction comes at the moment of democratic government when we realize that history is in our hands to make one way or another. The future is something that we are going to enact as a civilization on this planet and there, science fiction is that literature that discusses that by doing scenario building. It's not really about prediction per se, although I wouldn't want to deny that it does have an element of prophecy in it and that is part of its power. Um, it's not true what is sometimes said that science fiction is really just a way of talking about today right now. It is that, but it also partakes of the ancient power of prophecy. And whereas a lot of literature that is not straight realism will present itself as a kind of a surrealism and say, in effect, um, I had a dream, which is really one of those statements that you don't want to tell someone because they immediately begin to stop listening to you. And that's a lot of contemporary literature. But science fiction says this is going to happen to all of us. But it's conditional. And what it's really saying is this could happen to all of us. And if you do X, you get Y. So it's profoundly historical. And it has embedded in every science fiction tale a philosophy of history being expressed. Because if you say, if we do X, we'll get Y, you necessarily are expressing a philosophy of history. So um, it's a philosophical literature by talking about the future all the time as it does. Now, the content of the future is various, and so the content of science fiction is various. And so within science fiction, there are subgenres where they'll be talking about some things that are extremely likely to happen, like climate change or a population growth or fall, um, environmental damage. There will also be things that are flatly uh, impossible and will never happen, such as faster than light travel or time travel, and yet these are still in. The, and then there are things that can't be predicted whether they're likely or not, such as a, an alien walking into the back of the room. I mean, it seems like a low probability event. It could happen. It might not happen. Uh, there's no way for us to tell. And very often, science fiction texts will mix together these uh, disparate elements into one text so that there's a strange uh, underlying cognitive dissonance when you read science fiction saying, well, yeah, this is very likely, but wait a second, that's impossible. But it's also embedded in these human characters doing things that seem very realistic. So. It's interesting as such. Now, I want to split it up in a way that isn't as common as, uh, as these other ways of what topics get discussed and say that science fiction being about the future, it can be near future, far future, or in between. And these are very different in their affect. So near future science fiction um, is really kind of day after tomorrow. Um, it's a genre of its own. It's very common. And I would want to suggest to you that near future science fiction is really now just the realism of our time. Because the shadow of the future, the quickness of technological and cultural change, the many surprises that come up every three to five years mean that when we think about now, we are um, already thinking about the near future as well and things that are going to come. So when you write near future science fiction, um, it's a kind of modernism, a, a kind of realism, I mean. It's about right now. Um, and usually, a near future science fiction is not dated. In other words, you don't see a text that say, it is the year 2024. That would, be, that would destroy the effect, which is to give you that uneasy feeling that this is really about now, and yet there's stuff that hasn't happened yet. And near future science fiction, I can tell you from personal experience, can also fall into a kind of an uncanny valley, where people who like to read a, a literature about us now will not read near future science fiction because it's science fiction and therefore weird. People who like science fiction, they want to get off planet, they want to do space opera, et cetera, et cetera. So near future science fiction is too realistic, and they're not interested in it either. So it can become a zone where nobody really wants to read it. On the other hand, some very successful writers have lived there their entire career and have made it their brand, uh, like William Gibson. So it's an interesting subgenre. Then far future is space opera. And we know it from Star Trek, Star Wars. It happens, who knows, million, thousands or millions of years 
in the future. It's disconnected from history per se because it happens so far as so many things have happened. So many problems have been solved and put aside so that we're zipping about in spaceships, usually it, throughout the galaxy. And this space opera can be regarded as a version of a fantasy, a story space. But you can also say that human beings uh, living millions of years from now is, a, is a, a relatively optimistic statement. And it's a, so therefore a kind of a, a, a utopian literature in disguise where many problems have obviously been solved. Technology is almost like magic. We can do it almost anything. We're zipping about. And um, it's post-scarcity. So the problems that, that are discussed in space opera, when it's done, it, it can just be a game space, and it often is. But when it's taken seriously, you get something like, say, the culture novels of Ian Banks, uh, uh, my late departed friend, whose, um, uh, say, 15 culture novels are about the problems that are going to confront a post-scarcity society that it will never be stable. There will always be dynamic. There will be problems. What kind of problems are there, and how do you deal with them? So that one time the culture comes to the earth in 1977, for instance, and it's implied, uh, Banks implies that this solar uh, civilization being run by artificial intelligences is already out there. Well, it's a peculiar thing, but if you want to actually read a literature that uh, gives us some thoughts about what do we do uh, in Syria right now, the space operas of Ian Banks would be more used to your thinking about it than any literary realism that we see on the New York Times bestseller list. And this is weird, but uh, we're thinking about um, problems of an advanced uh, civilization that is nevertheless by no means established and a sure thing for good. And those artificial intelligences, the machines that kind of run the world in space opera, those are metaphors for our legal systems. Um, there won't be machine intelligence, but certainly our legal systems will be running things for us, and they could become very enhanced by the computer power. So, um, so space opera, although it can be completely silly, and just for the fun of it, which is fine, can also be an interesting uh, story space to, to think about these kind of historical issues. Then in between, you get the, what I call the future history, and this is an odd zone, and this is the only zone that usually has dates. Uh, it's only a few centuries out, and therefore the history that gets us from this moment to that moment is usually described, either explicitly or implicitly. But in any case, you have the, the strong, if we do X, we will get to Y. And so future history, I mean, examples are, say, Robert Heinlein, who had the future of the solar system, and every one of his fictions fit into a future history. Most science fiction writers won't restrain themselves to that single line of history, but rather will do like a weather spread a scenario building thing. We're starting from now, if we do X, we do Y, but if we go A, we get to B. And the spread goes from the generally dystopian tone, or like things are a mess, of near future science fiction. Because near future science fiction is usually relatively dystopian. Very few of us, and I'm one of the few, so I know this, have had near futures that have a positive vibe and are somehow utopian. Then space opera, on its general vibe, is kind of utopian because we've gotten to the year 10 million and we're out there zipping around the galaxy. It's the one in between the future history where you have a little bit of both and you have what you might call the muddled middle. The history is not going to be either dystopian or utopian, but are going to be a mix of things all happening at once. Dangers, successes, problems, solutions. And so to me, it's the most interesting zone of science fiction. It's also the most depopulate. It's the one most likely to have dates. Um, so, and I, I guess I should always talk about, we need to talk about Olaf Stapleton as the great future historian, where in his books, Last and First Men and Star Maker, he gives the history of the human race through its next, uh, say, 18 speciesations. And uh, so really billions of years of history in just a couple hundred pages, a, a strangely compressed future history, like a prose poem or like something that William Blake would do, very much worth looking at because of its, uh, the way that it inspires thoughts about these things. And then I just want to say, well, what's it for? I mean, uh, and uh, I would say that yesterday I was flying here and the New York Times business page had an extremely interesting article by Eduardo Peralta about the economics of climate change as an investment and return problem. And he, he, he contrasted the moral model and the business model as investing uh, either more or less to mitigate 
climate change. And in the same page was an article about the income disparity that has come about since the privatization movement and how the top 1% of income gatherers uh, make 50% of the income and the top 10% of stockholders own 90% of the stock. Well, all this was enumerated. It was all in numbers. And we need numbers. We need quantification. That's very scientific. But there's something disconnected. Uh, these articles appear in the same page, and yet no one ever puts them together. There's talk of, of uh, the cost of climate change as if we could pay our way out of certain things, as if we could maybe pay our way out of a mass extinction event or ocean acidification leading to a mass extinction event. And, and there's never acknowledgment of ecology when we do economics. These disconnects are, are not just subsets of the newspaper, but they're in our heads and in our behaviors. Science fiction does thick texture. It tells stories where all of it comes together into a, a way that is gnarled, into a tale that you can either believe or not. But you get to look at the evidence in terms of details of what people say, what they do. Stories are either ring true and seem plausible, or they're absurd and they, and they seem ridiculous. Michael Crichton is an example. Um, and so you, what, you, what you get out of science fiction is something that you don't get out of the quantification, the science, the New York Times. You get uh, stories, you get fiction is also values, as was spoken in the earlier panel. So this, I think, is what the, uh, my community is engaged in. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Dan. Dave? Hey. <clears throat> well, since I'm an historian of science, uh, David suggested I might uh, on the art and uh, science of predicting the future. I decided that was a dangerous game because depending on, uh, on uh, the people chosen and the time scales involved, the uh, success of the predictions would predictably be good, bad, indifferent, or, or unknown. Uh, so instead, I've, I've decided to take three representations uh, and examine briefly what their view of, the, of humanity was and how that reflects our ho uh, hopes and fears. Uh, and I've, I myself have been greatly influenced by people like Olaf Stapledon and Arthur C. Clarke and Stanislaw Lem. And uh, uh, in spite of that, I'm going to try and stay away from science fiction because I knew you were going to talk about uh, the science fiction part of it. Uh, but I will say, though, that uh, I was amazed when I was over at NASA, the influence of science fiction on people at NASA, um, you know, uh, in including myself, uh, going into science in the space program. So the kind of work that you were doing is, is very important for science as well. Well, since I'm a former NASA chief historian, you won't be surprised if uh, I start out with some space exploration stuff. And uh, no uh, visionary better represents that uh, in its formative years, at least, than, uh, than uh, Werner from Brown. Uh, as my colleague uh, Mike Neufeld over at the Air and Space Museum has shown in his definitive uh, biography of um, von Brown, subtitled Dreamer of Space, Engineer of War, Von Braun was a flawed figure. Uh, he was a brilliant engineer, but one with Nazi connections who made many Faustian bargains throughout his life. Uh, this is summed up in the satirist uh, Mart Saul's parody of the 1960 movie on, on uh, Von Braun. You've all heard of this, I'm sure. It was called I Aim at the Stars, to which uh, Saul added, but sometimes I hit London. Uh, Faustian bargain. From an early age, von Braun's vision for humanity was to go to Mars, and his 1952 book, The Mars Project, envisioned a fleet of 10 spacecrafts carrying 70 uh, astronauts to Mars. And he had a scaled-down version of this uh, in 1952 in Collier's Magazine, which really popularized the idea. And so the so-called von Braun paradigm was, uh, was, uh, was born. That paradigm is space shuttle, uh, space station, moon, and Mars. And it's influenced NASA over many decades, well beyond uh, uh, Von Braun himself, including in 1992 when the senior President Bush stood on the steps of the Air and Space Museum down there uh, and introduced his space exploration initiative, um, uh, which included uh, going to Mars. And in 2004, when the younger President Bush came over to NASA headquarters a few blocks over there uh, in the wake of the Columbia disaster and incorporated moon, Mars, and beyond in his uh, space uh, vision for space exploration. Of course, none of those initiatives have gotten off the ground uh, to the great disappointment of many of us who um, were told that in the post-Apollo era we would, be, we would have humans on the moon or on, on Mars in by 1984. Uh, not going to happen. Didn't happen. 
Um, all of this begs the question, why go to Mars, especially with humans, and why should that be part of the vision of the future of humanity? Uh, the reasons are many, but uh, perhaps one of the most far-seeing or, or crazy ones, depending on your perspective, is that uh, one of the great goals of the space program should be to get at least a small group of us off of the planet so we don't have to start over from scratch with 3.8 billion years of, of evolution uh, in the event of a catastrophic uh, event. This was the view of former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin, and we tend to think in the short term until something happens like the fireball last February over, over Russia reminds us that large objects can and do hit the Earth and have hit the Earth in the past. We could be wiped out tomorrow. In other words, there'd be no future for humanity um, unless we uh, have a colony off Earth. Of course, this is a difficult and expensive um, undertaking, but it's not impossible. My own opinion for what it's worth is that we should head for the, the more accessible moons of Mars, which were discovered uh, here in DC. Many people don't realize this, but at the Naval Observatory, just a couple of blocks from the, from the White House uh, with the 26-inch uh, telescope. And therefore, they have a peculiar, peculiarly American uh, history. Phobos and Deimos are, the, are uh, small potato-shaped moons of Mars that orbit only a few thousand miles above the Martian surface. Low gravity, ready-made space stations. I should say that the humans to Mars vision is not the unanimous opinion of scientists. There are plenty who think that robotic spacecraft should uh, or will do just fine. And that goes over the debate, uh, goes into the debate over human uh, exploration, including what is, in my opinion, the misguided question of why spend money on space exploration anyway when there are so many problems on the Earth. Aside from the fact that we would never explore space, we wait for all the problems on the Earth to be solved, and that other countries will do it if, if we don't. There's the argument that, which Congressman uh, Smith uh, raised this morning, that to be human is to explore, um, which many of us think is very important, but which causes others to roll their eyes because it's a somewhat esoteric uh, uh, argument. But uh, we can talk about that maybe uh, more, but let me uh, move on to a second quite different uh, scenario, and that is um, a vision for the future of humanity by Ray Kurzweil. Many of you will have heard uh, a vision of the future of artificial intelligence. In his, books, in his books, such as The Singularity is Near, uh, Kurzweil, who is a, a very successful uh, inventor and a very smart person, has notoriously predicted that over the next few decades, our human machine civilization will become increasingly dominated by its non-biological components. So not to put too fine a point on it, uh, according to Kurzweil, the machines, the artificial intelligence, may outstrip us in intelligence not in 1,000 years or 10,000 years, but in the 21st century. That might be too optimistic or, or too pessimistic, depending on your, on your uh, point of view. Uh, but if you think about it, it's not totally unrealistic, um, certainly not in the long term. In fact, I've written articles championing, championing uh, what I call the post-biological universe, the idea that there uh, is, if there's intelligence out there in the universe, it may well have evolved beyond flesh and blood, and be post-biological. And Seth, I think, has also raised that point, and others have raised it as well. Also not, uh, not unlikely. Um, the only question is how long it will take to uh, happen here. It's not a ridiculous question, despite sounding pretty far out. So the Anthropocene that we're talking about here today is about changing, is about humans changing the planet, but we should remember that we may uh, not only be changing the planet, but changing ourselves. Uh, uh, just as the extraterrestrials may already have. So uh, let me turn uh, as, as the, the final uh, person I want to talk about to Carl Sagan, whose papers are just now being uh, processed here at the Library of Congress, and uh, who I believe uh, David knew very well growing up. Uh, Sagan is well known for many things, uh, for his achievements in astronomy, for his uh, involvement with the space program, uh, his public outreach in the Cosmos TV series, uh, his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Dragons of Eden, Nuclear Winter, and uh, his movie in the book Contact, and so on. His vision for the future comes out in all of these uh, endeavors, including his cosmic perspective that we're only the latest products in the unrolling of 13.7 billion years of 
cosmic evolution that were not in any way central physically and perhaps not biologically. But let me focus here just for a minute on his, uh, the sequel to Cosmos, his book Pale Blue Dot, which has a, a subtitle, A Vision for the Human Future in Space. Now in that book, Sagan picks up many of his themes that I've already uh, mentioned, that asteroids uh, pose an ex existential threat uh, to life on Earth, that human spaceflight and exploration are important uh, for the survival of the species and so on. And he also emphasizes uh, what I think is another interest of David's, that uh, studying the other planets helps us to understand our own planet. Um, he was, after all, the first, uh, or at least among the first, to posit the run, uh, runaway greenhouse effect on Venus, where temperatures today are about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. But Sagan also takes up, once again, one of the signature topics of career, his career, and that is extraterrestrial intelligence. And this really is one of the great wild cards in the future of humanity, and it has particular significance to our topic today on the longevity of human civilizations. Will we survive our world-changing te technologies? Why are ETs significant for, for the future? Because in our quest to discover if intelligence uh, exists beyond Earth, Sagan asks, have they survived their world-changing technologies? The, uh, the famous Drake equation at attempts to estimate the number of communicative technological civilizations in the galaxy, and more generally, it emphasizes the importance of the, uh, the longevity of a technological civilization. Uh, it's because if civilizations last a million years, there are going to be a lot more of them around than if they last only uh, a, a thousand years. Unfortunately, we've not discovered any extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, you can talk to Seth about that, uh, who's at the SETI Institute. Uh, and so we have only one data point, the Earth. Civilizations on Earth have survived uh, in one form or another for about 5,000 years. Perhaps the great silence from outer space indicates that civilizations do not survive much beyond that. Or maybe ETs don't exist at all, or maybe we're just not looking in the, in the proper uh, way. But either way, it's uh, sobering to contemplate those scenarios and uh, as we are doing here today and the effect that they'll have on our future. So let me just conclude by saying, addressing this question, will we survive our world-changing technologies? Uh, I'm well aware that in choosing only three representatives uh, from the science and engineering community, I'm uh, projecting based on what scientists call small number statistics, right? Um, uh, in other words, the sample is, is very small. Uh, moreover, as I said at the beginning, predictions are, uh, they can be good, they can be bad, they can be indifferent. Or as Arthur C. Clarke said, uh, we may be dealing with a failure of imagination. But be that as it may, the Von Braun uh, story, I think, reminds us that we may not survive if there's a catastrophic event, unless we've had the foresight to get at least a small group off the planet. The Kurzweil story indicates that we may survive, but not in our present form. Uh, and the Sagan story indicates that in the happy event that we do survive, we need to see ourselves in the much broader cosmic context, which someone um, mentioned here this morning, and be prepared to interact with uh, extraterrestrials, whether they're biological or post-biological. And taken together, uh, these uh, three scenarios also indicate that to some extent, the future is in our own hands, as in space colonies and space exploration in general. Those are decisions that we make or how far we decide to take artificial intelligence unless they decide to take us somewhere. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the future is not in our hands if we're hit by a civilization destroying asteroid or if extraterrestrials uh, find us rather than the other way around. Uh, Stephen Hawking has had some things to say about that. Uh, we can only control part of our future and only if we think in the long term rather than in the short term. And I think we're notoriously bad about thinking in the long term. Uh, which is why I applaud David for having this discussion here uh, this morning on the long-term future of humanity. A few years ago, I wrote in the, the um, NASA 50th anniversary uh, proceedings that it's always tempting to sacrifice the short-term for the long-term, uh, and it's almost always a bad idea unless survival is at stake and there is no long-term. Uh, so I think we need not only to, to think and discuss about the long-term, but also to act as if there will be a long term. Great. Thank you, Steve. And Ursula? <laughs>
So I come at these questions as a scholar of literature. And so um, everything to me, all the problems of the world are boil down to questions of storytelling and metaphor. What's the, what kind of plot is being developed here? What, who are the major characters? And so under that heading, I wanted to come back to a question that came up on the first panel, which is that question of the we, who is the we? or who is the human. So I work at UCLA, I'm in the Departments of English and Comparative Literature, but also in the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, as David mentioned, and so I interact a lot with scientists. And one thing that has been very striking to me um, over the years is the fact that the assumption that humans are somehow one entity because they are biological species tends to come very easily to scientists, but it's an extremely difficult assumption for humanists, because in our daily work, we're confronted head on all the time with the enormous differences that you encounter when you study human communities, uh, cultural differences, linguistic differences, um, historical differences, social differences. So for us, the we, the human, is not a given. It's something that you always have to painstakingly assemble every time you use that term. Um, and a lot of humanists are very cautious about using terms such as humanism, um, humanity, mankind, um, because of the, frankly, lousy track record that these terms have in Western history. I mean, a lot of us um, look at histories of imperialism and colonialism, where it was very common to say, um, oh, uh, we stand for the universal human, and the universal human is French or the, the universally human is, of course, British. And so to the extent that somebody else doesn't measure up, they're not completely human. They're a little subhuman or maybe three-fifths human or something like that, right? Um, so, so using the human, these kinds of universalisms um, have a very tricky history that I think people in the humanities tend to be much more jumpy about um, than scientists are. And um, one way in which the human or smaller communities, of course, get constructed is through storytelling. And that's, that's something that, that literary scholars are really, really interested in. So, so stories are essentially mechanisms, technologies, to use um, David Biello's sort of extended use of that term, for assembling a particular we. And when you look at um, something like the novel, which is a particular genre that arose in Europe in the 18th century, along with the rise of the bourgeoisie, well, if you look at um, you know, what, what literary historians and scholars have written about the rise of that genre over the last 40 or 50 years, um, one prominent function it had at the time was precisely to assemble the new we's of European nations that were just then in the process of being formed at a time when people did not think of themselves as French or Italian or Spaniards. They thought of themselves as Galicians or as Piemontese or as Auvergne. And they had to be gradually and through political, military, and cultural work persuaded to consider themselves as, as French or um, or Italians. Um, I'm German by birth, and of course for us this came even later, late in the 19th century. Before that, um, German did not mean what it meant, what it meant today. Um, so so these, the stories about individuals and families that your run-of-the-mill 19th century novel tells, um, and literary historians have shown this in some, in some detail, um, serve the purpose of assembling a particular we. And you can go back and you can also, of course, analyze the cosmologies of indigenous communities and so forth and other kinds of stories, um, all of which are always in the business of, of assembling we's. And so I think um, that's something that's, that's um, extremely important to think about when we talk now about assembling that global we that comes with the notion of the, of the Anthropocene. Um, and um, so if you think about um, the Anthropocene, I think um, I would actually call it a science fiction device in this particular sense. Um, that science fiction, um, as I read it, and this is complementary to, to Stan's reading of it, um, I think it actually emerged shortly after the novel as a subgenre um, of the novel, and in many cases tried to recuperate something from an older genre of storytelling, which was epic. An epic was really sort of a form of storytelling that tried to talk about the world as a whole, such as it was known, 
to the community that produced it. So if you think of the Popol Vuh, you think of the Mahabharata, you think of the, the Iliad or the Odyssey, you think of the Aeneid, those were all attempts to account, yes, for one particular people, but in a much more general account of, of the world as a whole. And science fiction, in both good and bad ways, one of its tasks has always been to talk about the planet as a whole and to talk about humankind as a whole when other species of novels were more concerned with talking about particular national entities. So I think um, that's sort of something that's interesting to keep in mind. Um, and I think the, the best contemporary science fiction that tries to think about the global we um, does something that's really interesting. Because the problem, of course, with, with ancient epic, when you want to use it in the contemporary age, is that um, it's sort of this of arms and the man I sing, right? It is one voice speaking. Whereas today, when you speak about a global we, clearly you have to speak with many voices, many different languages, many different cultural understandings of nature, of what it is to be human, of men and women, um, of different races, of what it means to interact with other species have to be present in some ways. And one reason that I'm a big fan of the Mars trilogy is that I think Stan does precisely that. So the people who who um, settle on Mars in his trilogy are not humans. They're Swiss, they're Japanese, they're Russians, they're Arabic. And they come with their different cultural and historical baggages. And whatever the global we, the planetary community is that's going to emerge on Mars has to be forged out of that. Um, other science fiction writers have, um, have tried to do that same, undertake that same project in a somewhat different way. So, the um, science fiction writer David Brin wrote a formerly really, really interesting novel in 1990 called Earth, where he tries to combine an epic voice with the polyphony, the many voices of the, high, the urbanist novel of high modernism. So he goes back to the model of John Dos Passos, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, um, Alfred Dublin in Germany, all of whom tried to talk about the heterogeneity and the multiplicity of the modern metropolis as they experienced it in the 19-teens and 20s by combining a lot of different discourses, um, different social classes, different genders, different races, the discourses of radio, of advertisement, um, the interior thoughts of somebody just walking down the street. And the result is not smooth, linear narrative that works toward a, a conclusion, a closure that you can sit back from and say, ah, so now we know who the murderer was. It's not that kind of narrative. These are very jarring kinds of stories that leave you in many ways dissatisfied, torn between different ways of engaging with a contemporary world. Um, and Bryn's Earth, it has sort of a sucky, corny ending, admittedly, but most of the novel is really um, ambitious in trying to apply that model to a near future world set in 2038, um, where he tries to envision, so what's happened with climate change and what does it look like from, in, uh, you know, from the perspectives of people, very different um, people around the world. And there are other models, John Brunner and a previous generation of, um, of science fiction writers also um, adopted that model. So I think um, some, of the, some of the most interesting storytelling actually goes back to that pre-modern form of the epic and then combines it with some of the most adventurous forms of, of the 20th century novel um, to come to some formulation, always tentative, always shifting, of what that global we might be. And I think that's important to keep in mind when you think about something like the Anthropocene. And I thought it was very interesting that on the previous panel, a good deal of the discussion revolved around the way in which the Anthropocene has become a shorthand for thinking about the way in which humans and nature are no longer distinct and the way in which nature, what we want to save about it is clearly not some pristine nature that's been untouched by humans. And I found myself thinking, that's completely true, and I agree with that, but that's news really only to North American environmentalists. If you look at German environmentalism, or you look um, you know, at the environmental movement in India, they've never revered wilderness as their bottom line for what to save about the world. So, so even the way in which the Anthropocene gets uh, talked about in cultural discourse is in all kinds of ways shaped by particular cultural, national, class-based, um, what have you, cultural assumptions that I think we need to, we need to pay um, attention to. And so um, and in order to be able to do that, um, I think um, one thing that we really need, and, and David Bielow, I think, um, alluded to this on the previous panel a little bit, 
um, is attention to cultural and linguistic diversity and to cross-cultural and cross-linguistic literacy. And so I think that's sort of the, the enormous urgency of the humanities. And so I always get a little distressed when we talk about the future of human civilization and all that get, gets mentioned is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, I think actually what's equally and perhaps even more necessary is to work for a basic, um, at least bilingualism, um, and a basic sort of cross-cultural literacy um, in every citizen of this country, and in fact, every other country, but a lot of other countries are uh, much more multilingual and multicultural um, than Americans tend to be. And so I'll, I'll conclude there. I think it's, this is not just about technology and engineering. If we want to know what technology and engineering, what math means, what particular artifacts mean, um, we need a different kind of humanities, but maybe post-humanities, not in the Kurzweil sense, um, but in the sense in which people in, in my field use it, which is not about you know, detaching humanness from its bodily um, incarnations, but to, to think critically about the legacies of humanism in the Western world and to come to a post-humanism that, yes, of course, is still human and wants to address the human, but wants to address it in the way that Stan does in the, in the Mars Trilogy from a really diverse point of view. All right, thank you. Wow, a really uh, interesting set of ideas and concepts. I'm sure glad this is being recorded so I can play it back and hit pause a lot and <laughs> ponder. Uh, so now um, you guys have the opportunity to uh, respond um, to anything that um, the other panelists have said and then uh, we'll open it up. So any, any thoughts? Yes, uh, um, Steve brought up a couple of common science fiction stories that are uh, you might call memes in that they're, com they're, they're stories told more than once by more than one writers and, and they're, they shade from science fiction over into say futurology or futurism and, um, and, and can all then become um, um, uh, shade over into a monetized scam of various sorts. And uh, because science fiction was the origin of uh, Scientology, I'm very sensitive to this kind of movement. One of them, this idea that we go into space because then if we kill ourselves or if an asteroid kills us, then humanity will live on. I'm very dubious about this. The, the, first of all, the possibility that humanity could live on without the Earth, now that we know that 80% of the DNA in our bodies is not human DNA, we are creatures of Earth. We are bubbles of Earth. And we may be so ecologically tied to this planet that space is always an alien space in which we cannot survive except temporarily in, in little bubbles of protection and then need to come back. So I'm getting very terracentric. And Joanna Russ has a great novel called We Who Are About To that absolutely deconstructs the idea that a small group of humans could survive. And then if they did, wouldn't they be post-traumatic to the point where it would be almost pointless anyway. <laughs> so that's one story that it's told that I don't like. But m more importantly, the singularity. This uh, Kurzweil uh, MIT studio notion that um, the machines are going to take over and that we will be replaced and maybe we'll get to download or upload ourselves into machine consciousness. This is a terrible misreading of uh, brains, of computers, and of history all at once. And, I will, and there's a kind of thing called scientism, where you assume that because science has done so much, it therefore can magically do everything. That's not true. And one of the things that we'll never understand is the human brain. And you think, well, but wait a second. We have all these methods for investigating it. A dead brain we can cut apart and look at with electron microscopes right down to the atomic level. A live brain we can only study indirectly by way of blood flow, blood sugar, electrical activity. And those methods of studying the live brain are several magnitudes, maybe many magnitudes, larger than the level of what's really happening in our thinking. And that means that thinking and consciousness, we don't understand at all. We don't even have good models for it. It's not like a computer. And if you look into the history of human thought, you see that the, we're constantly thinking that the human mind is like the best machine we can make. So that for Descartes, it was a clock. And then for a while, it was a steam engine. For Freud, it was a steam engine, right? There's pressures, there's release, there's repression, blah, blah. Then briefly, it was a hologram that didn't seem to work very well. Then, of course, it became a computer, never even close to true. And what's happening in the human mind, since we can't model it, we can't reproduce it, we can't upload ourselves into a machine, and machines don't have consciousness. We don't even know what consciousness is. It's going to remain mysterious for 
thousands of years. So this idea of the singularity is a fantasy that we tell. And some people try even to monetize it. But in any case, it's a story that isn't going to come true. And yet, if we put it out over and over again, then we begin to think, well, we're not really responsible for history very much longer. Um, and I'm saying that artificial intelligence is always just a metaphor for our legal systems. And we're always still going to be in control. It's always our willpower. We're the only creatures that have consciousness and will. Although the other sentient creatures on the planet, maybe right down to mosquitoes, they're sentience for sure, but not in our machines. And um, that won't come for until maybe we can get quantum computers. And then, of course, it becomes another open question, another science fiction scenario. But the singularity is not close at hand. I think it's important to say that because um, as a, you know, the science fiction community becomes a kind of a, a, a garbled um, 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 message about, well, this is the future that we're all facing. And if the story is retold enough, you can get you know, the cyberpunk story that capitalism is going to win, that there's no fighting it, that you might as well go down into the mean streets and find your corner and persist. This is a very 1980s story. These stories ha can be damaging if we think, oh yeah, the future is inevitable and we're not in control of it. We're always in control of it. And we need to keep that in mind and analyze these stories uh, for, their, for their plausibility and, and their possibility. I would agree that the singularity is not near. I actually come to it from the astronomical point of view of extraterrestrial civilizations where you possibly had civilizations who, we don't know, but could have existed for millions of years. And, uh, you know, there I think it's plausible to conjecture that the singularity had happened. Uh, but but, but uh, wouldn't you agree intelligence may be emergent? In other words, we didn't have heavy metals for many of the billions of years of universal history that um, the uh, universe has been evolving, including things like um, uh, elements like gold. Um, you know, the, all of the heavy elements uh, didn't exist for billions of years, and it took supernovas, it took second and third generation stars, it took neutron stars colliding, and then there will be like planet-sized lumps of gold. Full, you know, there's some quite beautiful universal history stories that we're unpacking. But um, consciousness may be a late emergent property. Well, but you had, you had heavy metals and all that, you know, within a few billion years, if not sooner, after the Big Bang. So that still leaves 10 billion years. So, so if you're trying to argue that we may be the first intelligence, you know, in the universe, it's possible, but I think it's unlikely. Of course, there's no empirical evidence. <laughs> uh, also, uh, uh, so uh, anyway, I, I agree with you that the singularity is not near uh, on Earth. Um, but I'm surprised to uh, hear the author of the, the Mars trilogy say that you know you don't think it's important to have colonies off Earth. Oh no, that's not true. I think it's important and it's interesting, but it's not uh, the the reason to do it is not to save humanity, but just to, just because it's an interesting project like gardening or um, going somewhere else, making a cathedral. Um, and so the utilitarian value, I think, of the space colonies and and the solar system is what I would focus on because another argument I have with a very common science fiction story is going to the stars. I actually think the stars are out of our reach, that the universe is way bigger than we usually allow ourselves to imagine, and that we can't get to even the nearest stars in um, proper biological time. But in any case, we get out to Mars, we get out to near space, it's great. We should do that. It's, it's not because it, it saves us from uh, extinction. It's because it helps us just to do better. Uh, um, it's a, it's a, a project of huge interest and um, uh, beauty, but per, but not in this kind of salvational uh, sense of oh, all humanity, if we were all to die. First of all, you would have to have the most ungodly impact of all. I mean, worse than the KT impact to, uh, get to uh, kill all humanity at once. And um, uh, hopefully we will do the Rusty Schweikert thing and we will knock these uh, asteroids aside, that it makes sense to go into space to start protecting ourselves. But these apocalyptic dreams, this kind of rapture for the nerds, as they call the singularity, this, this disaster of, uh, I mean, these are, these are peculiarities. These are ahistorical and apocalyptic. And, and there's a big thing in the Western imagination of, of, of enjoying the imagination of apocalypse. But I'm saying let's um, uh, acknowledge that we're stuck in history and that we need to make do. So that really the story of today ought to be can we actually adapt our economic system to deal with climate change effectively and, and avoid a mass extinction event? I mean, that's, that's the unavoidable story right now. And the other stories are, are much more hypothetical and, and um, 
But I think what that foregrounds is also that there are two different tendencies in science fiction. I mean, there's there's one strain, and they often coexist in the same in the same texts. One is that sort of attempt to transcend the body, to transcend materiality, to use technology to get beyond what are perceived as the limitations of our biological and physical being. But then there's also that other element of science fiction. I mean, the encounter with the alien is often the terror, but then also the, the delight and the joy of encountering a totally different biological body, right, and a different, and a different mode of perception. And even though in older science fiction, that is often just an allegory for encountering the alien other on Earth. I mean, think of the old Star Trek episodes from the 1960s, which were quite, quite transparently often just comments on on racial or, or ethnic conflict in the US or in, in the world. Um, but there is also that element that there, and, and I think that's more pronounced in, in recent science fiction, um, that what if we could actually imagine not a world in which bodies disappear and biology disappears, but a world in which biology proliferates, in which we have um, a lot of different biologies. That's the other imagination, and it's, and it's um, uh, it's made its way into something like um, the couple of articles that, that Freeman Dyson wrote about 10 years ago. Now, admittedly, he's always out on the edge, and I'm not holding him up as sort of the core of scientific wisdom. But it was an interesting speculation where he argued, well, what would happen if biotechnology got out of government and big corporate labs and were democratized in the same way that digital technologies were from the 1970s onward? What if every pigeon fancier and orchid grower had a little sort of um, biotech genetic toolkit in their garden tool shed and could create new species on a daily basis? Then he says what we might be facing in the 20, uh, 21st, maybe the 22nd century is not the total depletion of biodiversity, but we might be at the edge of a, a new Cambrian explosion of biodiversity, as he calls it. Um, now, there's, of course, from an environmental viewpoint, good reasons to be sort of a little bit scared about the idea of, of people creating and then releasing, you know, new species on a daily basis into the body. But, it, but it's interesting to, to think about because, of course, you could have legitimately had the same qualms about everybody carrying little com extremely powerful computers in their backpacks and, and jacket pockets in the 1970s, and that's no longer... Um, a scenario of terror for us. So, so I always think it's, it's kind of fact, interesting. It's, it's terror that we might lose ours. That, that we might lose ours, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, maybe it, it is possible to envision that, that biotechnology might become, uh, might become um, uh, democratized in some, in some similar ways, and there might be reasonably safe ways um, of doing so, which then would lead us away in a very material sense from, from the narratives of of, of loss and the sort of elegiac mourning of what nature there was in the past and to, you know, not just re recreating the Lang's metal mark butterfly, but creating new species of butterflies. Um, so that's, that's, I think, another possibility that's there where, where I think science fiction and, and futuristic, futurologist thinking um, has, has also developed the other strain where we sort of delight in the prospect of increased bodiliness and biodiversity and biologicalness and biological embeddedness. Yeah, I, I would also agree that, that the singularity as Kurzweil envisions it is, is a, a kind of a fantasy of the techno rapture, as you say, but I almost see it as a proxy of the, the game-changing, non-linear development that we can't predict that's going to change everything. And I do think that that will come along. It's just we don't know what it's going to be. I, in, in my reading of about the future written in the past. I, when I, I, I'm always impressed by some people that really got things right, but of course what they always get wrong are these game changers, <laughs> things that come along and really um, just sort of change everything. And, and you know, that, that can be a very hopeful prospect when we think about some of these dilemmas about energy and, and so forth. But it's, I think it's that, that, that's, that's the troublesome thing about this, this, uh, this effort of prophecy. You know, what, what are we, what do we not really, we tend to do these linear extrapolations of current trends. That's, what else can we do in, far into the future? But of course, things aren't going to be linear. I still think we're going to be stuck in history and the, the problem of scaling up so that you're never going to have this one moment, this, this singularity moment. And I'm wondering also if you're, if you're thinking of it as just transformative moments where we, where we no longer understand if the singularity was really uh, 2008, the financial crash.
because there's some tremendous work that shows that there's no one individual that actually understands what happened. And a lot of it happened in computers with extremely rapid trading and derivatives that nobody could predict. And in other words, that the global financial system was incomprehensible at that moment and we never have gotten in, in charge of it. So that maybe the singularity happened in 2008, we're in the post-singularity. So, but here we still are, we're still talking it over, we're still humans, we're still in control of history. And I think it's gonna keep happening like that. These, these moments when our technology is combined to get so complicated that there's no one human or entity that can uh, either understand or control it. And okay, we're in that. That's history now. Um, it's complicated. I like that. The singularity came. It wasn't that great, but we survived it already. <laughs> we yeah. kind of survived yeah. it. <laughs> I, I think at this point, let's uh, open up to the audience. I see a, um, a question right here. The microphone is on its way to you. I have so much to say. This is extremely exciting <laughs> to hear your opinions. Um, our, our futures are always uh, reflections and projections of our present and past. And Susan Sontag wrote an essay called The Imagination of Disaster in the 60s in which she talks why is this proliferation of science fiction, disaster, horror movies like them. And of course, it's, you know, the anxiety about the bomb. Uh, it seems to me that uh, historically the uh, literary community has always been more pessimistic about the future than the scientific community. Um, and you see that it's cresting after World War I and after World War II, whereas in the 1939 World's Fair and, uh, in New York City, right before World War II, you have this utopian view of the, of the future projected by the scientific and corporate world. Um, science fiction, however, is an interesting straddles both uh, the science and literature. So you see in the 40s and 50s this kind of the space opera's optimistic, triumphalist view of the future with Americans and Buck Rogers and so forth uh, uh, blazing the way to the stars. And then after the 60s, you find the postmodernist pessimism, apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic uh, uh, views proliferating, uh, Philip Dick and so forth. Uh, again, that kind of reflecting current uh, fears, problems, exigencies and so forth in our imaginative projections of the future. And science fiction, it just seems to me, is a very interesting uh, nexus, a connection between the optimistic and the pessimistic. Thank you. Yeah, response or? Uh, well, I think one, one reason for, for, um, for optimi I mean, for one thing, a lot of the optimistic science fiction stories are also sort of colonial fantasies, right? I mean, a lot of the time, the successful um, settlement on another planet where there are alien, I mean, there are often imperial fantasies behind that, so I'm a little more um, wary of them. But I mean, certainly, I mean, if we're talking about post-singularity, um, in some ways, I wonder whether the singularity wasn't Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I mean, the realization that humans now have a destructive power that could wipe out um, large parts of the planet certainly sort of was, was a watershed and it wasn't the only reason and maybe for somebody like Philip K. Dick, not the, not the main reason, but certainly um, marked a, a general, you know, general change in the perception, in the perception of science um, in the public at large, where there's sort of that social contract between scientists and public change, and it was no longer, oh well, science will deliver to us better standards of living, and in return, we just let the scientists do what they want in their labs, and we don't, we don't look too closely. But I also, I mean, inevitably, I probably have to say this, as the, as the literature scholar, um, there is also sort of just a formal issue that, that um, you know, stories about disaster and dystopias are just more interesting than, than <laughs> stories about positive futures, which tend to be so boring. And I say this with a certain historical relativism. I mean, it's interesting to, when you, when you teach um, science fiction classes, um, and you teach Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards from 1888, um, it's an incredibly boring book. You know, when you read it today, and students will complain when you make them read it in, in its entirety, but at the time, it was actually the second most popular book 
after Uncle Tom's Cabin, and there were um, Bellamy societies all over the United States that tried to implement his vision of the future. So talk about a sort of socially transformative work of fiction. That's, that's certainly one that had at least the makings of it. Um, but in general, I think it's true all the way back to, to Milton and Satan just being such a more interesting character than anybody else in Paradise Lost, that, that um, stories of, of conflict of, um, of dire predicaments are in some ways um, easier to tell than stories of positive development. That's why utopia has become such a, such a difficult genre because it's, it's harder to imagine and harder to sustain. Yeah, but I want to speak for the utopian novel. Um, uh, ever since Le Guin's The Dispossessed, uh, the, the um, ability of the uh, literary utopian novel to be more interesting has been greatly increased since Bellamy's time, which is, you know, 18... Ambiguous utopia. Well, but these, the utopian fiction a, needs a to be about the fact that it's a dynamic system. And ever since H.G. Wells is a modern utopia, what you see is the utopian novel is about the dangers involved to it from outside and the difficulties of keeping it going. So, and that's what Ian Banks' culture novels are about. That's what my utopian novels have been about. You can make utopia entering, and it's really dystopia that's boring in the end because they're always the same, and we're always condescending to these poor people who are living worse off than we are because the disasters happen. So, so there's an inherent superciliousness in reading dystopian feature, uh, fiction and enjoying it. And also, it's just so easy to do stage business and say, oh, God, danger, danger, danger. So I speak for utopia as against dystopia as being simply more interesting in the end. And, and I think it can be proved by texts. Now, there's some great extinction novels. Uh, Alas, Babylon and On the Beach, they changed public perception of nuclear arms. And they were important works of art in the negative tradition of saying, look, we could kill ourselves off flatly with these weapons, and then these weapons need to be brought under control. So um, there is that function as for the, the novel of absolute disaster, and, and the story of human extinction is a, a good story to tell from time to time. And now we need to tell the climate change stories over and over and over again, because we're stuck in that. And the last thing I'd like to say to you, what the point you brought up is, um, the scientists are now the ones that are sounding more pessimists than the rest of us, because they're running the numbers on um, the what carbon is going to do to this planet. So they're not like this column in the Times yesterday about how, oh, if we only pay, you know, a dollar fifty more of a carbon tax, then we'll get trillions of dollars. And if we don't do it, then we can just pay more trillions of dollars later, as if there's nothing at stake physically. And it's the scientists who are getting pessimistic now compared to the humanists. And that's uh, alarming. I think we had a uh, question in the back over here. Yeah, my um, question was in terms of the singularity. You, you kind of touched on this um, when you mentioned the financial collapse, but um, does it really matter if it's conscious or not? If you get to a place where um, superintelligence just can mimic um, intelligent life and, you know, and have this omnipotence, whether it's um, conscious or not, haven't we reached that point, this all-powerful super machinery that kind of can take over the world? Uh, so to speak. I think this is a great question. It makes the distinction that it, maybe we're, it's not consciousness we're talking about here in the singularity, but just that our own civilization, our own technology, which includes our legal systems, has gotten so big and complicated that we can't quite understand it. But I would assert that we're still in control. We can still change the laws. We can instruct the machines to do X rather than Y. We program it. We're programming the system. It's still a human a job, and so we even create our economy, even though it's big and complicated. We can simply say, you know what, it's, it's dangerous for big banks to fail, and therefore we're going to legislate that there be no more big banks. So, I mean, read John Lanchester in the London Review of Books, doing an analysis of the financial crash and beginning to deconstruct it. It, 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 it is amenable to analysis. It's, it's not so big that the human mind can't understand it. It's just that it's complex. And also, there are guns under the table. There are people who are profiting by the current system. The 1% that took 50% of the income last year, the 10% that owns 90% of the stock, they're, um, uh, they profit by the confusion. So um, confusion is actually a political act. And simplicity is also a political act or analysis. So yes, these machines are super quick but we're still programming them. It is strange, though, when, when one reads the uh, 
the business section or, or, or whatever, and you read about the market, it, it, the language is always about what the market wants and how's the mar market going to respond. It, it, you know, they speak of it as this conscious being, and maybe, yeah. maybe that's just journalistic shorthand or maybe that's an accurate description. And now that it's becoming allegory. more and more allegory, maybe that, that it, now that it's becoming more and more machine driven and all these decisions are being made without human uh, interaction at all, there is something to uh, that actually being the singularity. Um, I think uh, we're getting very close to the lunch hour. We're going to take one more question from this gentleman uh, in the front here. And oh, I'm sorry. Um, actually, would you mind that we have? So, so you've spoken before. We have um, someone over here who uh, Jason picked somebody here who hasn't spoken before. Thank you. And and um, please uh, make your question kind of brief, and then okay. we'll respond. And then um, uh, Carolyn Brown will. Uh, uh, briefly, I'll let you know what lunch options are and what's going to happen uh, next, because we will have a lunch break and then reconvene. So, uh, thank you. Uh, my question is about Stanley Robinson's comment that we're always in control of our history. And my own, as a biomedical scientist, one of my, one, one of my concerns is watching individual people die and the question of individual extinction. And my experience is that when people are dying, they are not in control, and they're filled with anxiety. And at some level, I think what we're talking about at a, in a literary and in a, a larger cu cultural context about extinction of humanity is really, in a sense, a projection of that same phenomenon. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm questioning whether or not we really are in control and that perhaps there's value in understanding what happens to human beings when they aren't in control, because we do have the capacity to regain control but we spend a lot of time, and perhaps increasingly, especially as we're aware of singularity phenomena such as the one you described in 2008, how dangerous the world is and how, how, in a sense, impossible and daunting the task of survival is as we become more conscious and more knowledgeable about our own existence. Well, I guess I would say yes. It's a, it's a, we're not in control uh, biologically. We're not in control of the Earth's ecology. We, we talk about managing the global environment, but in fact, because of the bacterial element involved and because of the complexity of life, it's like uh, riding the tail of a tiger. You know, we try to hang on as long as we can. And so it's a, a, a really a complicated and dangerous process. But I would say we write the laws and. Um, there is this attempt to come to an accommodation with the environment so that if we were to stabilize the population around 7 billion, and the way that we do that is the technology called justice in that the software is also a technology. So the legal system and our laws are technologies. You have to think of them that way because then we can tinker with them. And if the technologies allow for humanity to get in balance with the planet, then you get this utopian outcome of approximately a stable population of some several billion people, all of them living at adequacy or better, and at a minimum of adequacy, and going on from there, and you can imagine a utopian future in balance with the planet ecologically. And it's a, it's a project that's not impossible. It's not like faster than light travel or, or, or immortality. It's simply a, a possible project, an engineering project that includes the software of our legal systems. And the reason that justice is the crucial technology is that as soon as uh, the women of the planet have all of the full rights over their lives and their property, the population uh, uh, replacement rate goes to, uh, the, uh, the, the, the population growth rate goes to exactly replacement or a little bit below. So in other words, the growth of population that might uh, destroy our ability to exist on this planet is solved by justice, which is a great kind of double strand of, of moral goodness and uh, utilitarian survival strategy. And this is what I've been saying. We, we can't just muddle along anymore. It's either utopia or catastrophe, so we need to work towards utopia as a kind of an engineering project and not just a dream of perfection, but just a survival strategy. All right, well, on that hopeful note, let's thank the panelists, and then Carolyn will let you know about lunch. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.